Hello there ladies and gentlemen, how are you doing? It's Alexander Hilly123 here and it's time for a new video. And as you can see from the title, it's time for a new Vinyl Pickups video today, the first in around about six months on the channel. And today I have for you guys to show off seven vinyls. Usually I show off only five, the reason that it's seven is because I was given two of these to keep uh, a few months ago. And not only that, but three I got for Christmas. You might think, bloody hell. Three vinyls for Christmas, he's very spoiled. Well, apart from that, all I got was a good old boxes and, you know, socks and Lynx Africa, you know, shit like that. Your usual boring stuff you get for Christmas. Very important, but very boring. But yeah, three vinyls, I'll showcase to you guys which ones I got for Christmas. I gave my mum and my brother a list of vinyls, said, get any of these and I'll be happy. And so they did. But anyway, the first one, ladies and gentlemen, which is one that I purchased a long time ago because we showcased the oldest first and then the most recent I will showcase last. So you always see them in order that I purchased them and it is none other than the Stone Roses uh, self-titled debut album and an absolute colossus of an album. And this was released in May 1989 and it's just absolutely legendary you've got ian brown on the vocals his vocals were never very strong but back then they just worked really well and for a lot of people the best element of the stone roses was the drummer and the bassist uh, manny and rennie <laughs> but john squire on the guitar as well some beautiful uh, kind of spidery guitar riffs and whatnot similar to johnny marr from the smiths perhaps and this is when Mad Chester was just about starting. And the Hacienda and all that, you know what I'm fucking saying, lads. I don't know when I'm a bit Irish with a mank accent, but there we go. And there are uh, the boys in the studio as well. I remember seeing a story um, about this album and Ian Brown in the months, or maybe the year, I'd say, before it was released. It was actually on the scrap heap going to the old doll centre. And then a year later, he helps create one of the best albums of all time. I mean, it's truly remarkable. And it is one of the best albums of all time. And it's just anthemic. It's sing-along. But there's a lot of technicalities here as well. And it's just so consistent. I Want to Be Adored, She Bangs the Drums, Waterfall, uh, Bye Bye Bad Man. That's one of my favourite ones. Song for My Sugar Spun Sister, Made of Stone, Shoot You Down, This Is The One, I Am The Resurrection. There's goosebumps all over for me listening to this album. I think it's incredibly consistent, like I said, drumming, vocals, bass, it's all great. It's just such a shame that they couldn't have continued to you know, create music like this. The second album has a few great songs on it, but overall I just can't get into it. They've got a few great b-sides as well, but um, yeah, it's just what could have been with, with the Stone Roses. But thank goodness we have this album, it's a true masterpiece. It's a vinyl pickup, ladies and gentlemen. Next up, oh my god, what's this? Okay, well, I'll tell you what, we'll showcase, just to get them out of the way, because they're big and bulky, uh, my next two vinyls, which were given to me by my own mother. My own mother, who tells me that somewhere she has vinyls of Simon and Garfunkel and a band called Bread, which she has always recommended to me, but I've never actually checked out. I was like, get that Simon and Garfunkel one, please, because I would really like to have a Simon and Garfunkel vinyl if not maybe one day i'll get it myself however she did give me the vinyl of a band i've never heard of but it looks good it's called sergeant pepper <laughs> by the beatles yeah possibly the most famous album ever made and also a compilation if you will uh, love songs by the beatles and i consider myself a beatles fan but i'm not a hardcore beatles fan a lot of the singles and the songs that people know are my least favourite tracks amongst the band, kind of. No, I was going to compare them to Queen, but that's not right because I don't really know Queen's music. I'm talking bollocks, sir. Ignore me. But I don't mean to sound pretentious, but genuinely, a lot of Beatles singles are not as good as the songs that are on the albums where casual fans haven't listened to them. I can't give any examples, but this is the thing with the Beatles. I love the White Album, and is the White Album and Revolver two separate albums? I always get that mixed up. I can't remember. But Abbey Road is great as well. Rubber Soul is one that I love, which is, I think, the one before this, perhaps. But from 1964 to right until the last album in 1970, 
obviously they were incredible and people talk about how they overrated possibly so but you can see why they're so popular and they weren't just simple pop songs as well there was a good technicality within the band and i do like a lot of the kind of eastern influence like on this album within you without you that is great chill stuff Mr. John Lennon smoking some marijuana. You all know what I'm talking about. But here's the big thing about the Beatles. I've never liked this album. It's one of the most contentious music opinions that I have personally as a music fan. But yeah, how good is it to have these as a um, compilation? And they're in decent nick. You can tell they've been used. But holy shit, mum came through there. Awesome. Very happy with that. And like I say, I'm that Simon and Garfunkel one. But next up, ladies and gentlemen, we can't beat the Beatles, but this man gave it his best shot. It's Mr. Alex Turner with the Arctic Monkeys and Favourite Worst Nightmare. And this is the second Arctic Monkeys album released in 2007 on my little wish list that I created for my mum and my brother for Christmas. Uh, and like I say, I got three all together. This is one of them. My brother got me this. And I said either one of the first two Arctic Monkeys albums. To be honest with you, I just about say that the second album's better because I think the musicianship is slightly better. Alex Turner is on top of his game, and it's just such an easy album to listen to. Brian Storm, Teddy Picker, Dears for Dangerous, Balaclava, Fluorescent, Adolescent, um, Only Ones Who Know, Do Me a Favour. This house is a circus. It's bizarre as fuck. Or berserk as fuck. If you were there, they were. The bad thing, old yellow bricks, 505. And there's melancholy here. There's humour. There's Turner's lyrical brilliance. The drummer, Matt Helders, is incredible. And, you know, listening to Arctic Monkeys, they rocked more than a lot of other indie rock bands did at the time. And I think that's one of the reasons why they were successful. And these days, I think the last album... I can't even remember what it was called, the Casino Royale, <laughs> I can't remember what the fuck it was called, but um, that was their first dud, in my opinion, and um, Alex Turner's ego is up there right now, of course, but I've enjoyed everything that Tim Monkeys have done until that album, at Humbug, and Suck It and See, and AM. They were all good albums. I think if you piece together the best of those albums, you've got the potential for an album to be as good as this. But I just don't think, in my personal opinion, they've ever reached the heights of the first two. This is legendary indie rock. It's so easy to listen to. And it surprises me that people didn't like Arctic Monkeys back in the day. I don't know. But like other indie bands that, in my opinion, aren't as good as the Arctic Monkeys. But uh, there we go. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, what we've got here... We've got the second of my free Christmas vinyls. These next two were purchased by my mum. And she decided I needed to listen to some helmet. She decided I needed to run into a wall. And after I'd done that, punch people in the face. Because that is what this album will probably make you want to do. If you like hard rock and metal music and you've never listened to this, you've quite simply got to stop this Vinyl pickups video now, give it a thumbs up first of course, uh, and listen to the album because this is, I think it's underrated overall and I would have to say that I think Helmet's material in the early 90s was underrated. I think some bands went under the radar during that time because of the whole grunge movement. Helmet are not really grunge and I don't want to get into genres too much but it's chuggy, heavy, alternative metal. Uh, with shouted vocals by Paige Hamilton, the guitarist, down-tuned guitars, which are just absolutely disgustingly heavy. And the drummer, John Stanier, is one of the greatest drummers of all time, in my opinion. The groove section, the grooves on this thing are unbelievable. Head bopping and head banging. I ain't got the hurt to do it anymore, but holy shit. There's so much attitude and aggression, but so much melody. I love this album. Uh, Betty, the third album, <laughs> check that album cover out by the way, and Strap It On, the first album, are also really, really good too. After that, they made an album called Aftertaste in 97, uh, and that was the last good album in my opinion. Since then, the music has been average to quite poor. A few good songs here and there, Crashing Foreign Cars and Smart, 
Drug Lord, See You Dead, the decent songs. But Meantime is the best. And the album cover, if you're wondering, it's some kind of guy in a factory shoveling, maybe not a factory, but shoveling coal or some shit like that. And uh, yeah, Meantime, Iron Head, <laughs> Give It, Unsung, Turned Out, You Turned Out. Paige Hamilton just screaming. He's fucking angry. He feels bad, better, you better. Oh, man. You borrowed FBLA 2 and Role Model. Like I say, any rock metal fans never listen to this. You've got to give it a listen. It's from 1992. It's essential. It's Helmet. In the meantime... And we're going back to the early mid-90s now, ladies and gentlemen. This is a big, bulky vinyl, and it is beautiful. And it was really, really good to listen to. This is the last vinyl I listened to. There's only one more to show off, but the next one I'm going to show off after... This one I haven't listened to yet. I'll be listening to it in two days. But yeah, this one, it had more resonance to it because it is Sound Garden in the super unknown. And this was released in 1994. And of course, it has more resonance due to the fact that Chris Cornell is three years now since he committed suicide. And there's a lot of people on the YouTube comments because that's what I do. I go on genius.com, check out the lyrics listen, well I'm listening to my vinyl obviously, but I go on YouTube and look at the comments, my IQ gets lowered in the process because there's a lot of fucking idiots on this website, but um, I just go on there and see fans of the band and saying nice things about the music, it just gets me in the mood I think, to really appreciate these artists, whatever genre, whatever it is I'm listening to, but there was a lot of talk about the lyrics being about suicide and whatnot, and I'm going, yeah, I guess so, people should have seen the signs and everything, but I'm thinking to myself, well, what about old Pearl Jam music, Eddie Vedder's still here, old Stone Temple Pilot, Scott Weiland, obviously, he had a drug overdose, I don't know if he meant to kill himself, but all these old bands had lyrics like that somewhere within the songs, because they were people who were putting the emotions into the music music uh, lyrically and not all artists do that but that was one of the things of grunge so i don't think chris cornell was really on his own in that sense but there were a lot of those kind of lyrics but um this is a beautiful beautiful vinyl one of the best you know just like the alice in chains sap and jar of flies double ep that i got that was beautiful this is beautiful as well so is 10 by pearl jam I absolutely love that era of music, but it was between this and Bad Mortarfinger. Bad Mortarfinger, I think, was Soundgarden's third album, and Bad Mortarfinger is a little bit more alt metal, a bit more heavy all the way through, whereas this is a little bit more diverse with its influences, but it's definitely still got that hard rock sound. Chris Cornell's vocals, I don't need to speak of, because the man was on another level. And the guitarist, Kim, I don't know how to pronounce his surname, I never have, Fayal, something like that. He's great, and also the drummer, the guy who was in Pearl Jam, Ben Shepard, I think it is, I think that's his name. He's on another level too. The bassist, they're just a great band. And this is quite a long album, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 tracks. You've got heavy songs, you've got a bit of melancholy and Soundgarden, overall, if I had to rank all the bands from the early 90s, I'm not sure where I'd rank them, but I can't get a hold of Koa by Stone Temple Pilots, but I know it's controversial, I love Soundgarden, I love this album, but I prefer Koa by Stone Temple Pilots, but you can only get it like £200 second hand, I'm not paying that, but so many great bands are in that time. Alice in Chains are my favourite, then Pearl Jam, then Stone Temple Pilots, then probably Soundgarden, but then Smashing Pumpkins as well, and quite a few others to be honest with you. But Let Me Drown, My Wave, Fell on Black Days, love that song, Mailman, Super Unknown, Head Down, Black Hole Sun, Spoon Man, Limo Wreck, The Day I Tried to Live, Kickstand, Fresh Tendrils, that's a underrated track, 4th of July, holy shit that's heavy. Half like suicide and she likes surprises. I was like, oh, she likes surprises. That's a bit of a throwaway track, as far as I remember. I'd not listened to it for years. I listened to it on the vinyl, and it was like, oh my god, I forgot what a great song that is. There are a few tracks on this album where I look at the titles and I'm like, oh, I can't quite remember them. But then when I listened to the vinyl, I remembered just how damn good they are. 
and were. And um, yeah, legendary. Sound Garden, Down on the Upside, the 96, 97 album after this was pretty good as well. Not as consistent. It's quite similar, but just even less grunge influence, I'd say. With a grunge vibe. And their return in 2012, King Animal, is very much the same. It's a good, solid album, but I don't love it the whole way through. I like it, but don't love it. But Sound Garden, what a loss. And Chris Cornell, one of the best vocalists of all time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming up to the last vinyl, one of my uh, favourite albums, and it's one, I spoke about my mum's influence before, with the Beatles vinyls, and hopefully she'll come through and find that Simon and Garfunkel one, but this is a band she got me into when I was much younger, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it is Tears for Fears and Songs from the Big Chur. I don't know how big the chur is, it must be bigger than this one. Thankful that chur made some incredible noises. And I've got to tell you guys, there's only eight tracks on this album, but there isn't a moment where it isn't absolutely incredible. The bookends of the album, Shout and Listen, they start and end the album. Then you got The Working Goer, my personal favourite. Everybody Wants to Rule the World, which in my personal opinion is the best pop song ever made. And that's just me. Mother's Talk, I Believe, Broken and Head Over Heels. Mother's Talk is so good. And for me, Tears for Fears, I overall don't really like much of what happened in the 80s. I can find bands and songs I like from that decade, of course. But I love Tears for Fears. And they, at the same time, sound so similar to all the other bands that were around in the 80s with the drum machines and that 80s typical sound. But at the same time, they were totally different and you just got to listen to it and understand it and you'll agree but it can't really be explained at least not by myself not being very technical with music even though i love it but yeah they were just so good and i think one of the things and there was a documentary about the making of this album about a month or two ago but the 35 year anniversary was released in 1985 so it was the 35 your anniversary and i really loved that i got the vinyl as good as a I think it was a few days before the documentary it was one of the reasons why i thought yeah let's just get tears for fears i'll pay for that and it was a great documentary 35 year anniversary and the music was very melodic and easy to listen to but there were dark undertones there like it's not on this album it's on the first album the hurting but everyone will know mad world which gary jewels of course covered incredibly well it's one of the best covers of all time in my opinion i think i put it as one of my favorite covers when i did my favorite covers at youtube at the video a year or two ago whenever it was and that song basically is great because he interpreted that in such a moody melancholic sad way but the original by tia sophia's it's dum -bum 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 -bum. it's quite jolly sounding with dark lyrics i think that's something that we're really good at but the atmosphere on this album is fantastic. The dual vocals from Kurt Smith and Roland. Here we go. I've got to butcher his name. Roland Arazable. It's very Spanish, but I have no idea how to say it. It's just fantastic. And Chris Hughes and David Bascom, engineered and produced by it, says on the back. They were on that documentary and uh, showcasing how the album was made. And not just songs from Big Chur and The Hurting. Uh, what was the 1989 album called? Uh... Sowing the Seeds of Love, I think it was. And there's a song on that album called The Woman in Chains. <sighs> it's goosebump-inducing stuff. It's one of my top, top songs ever. And you should listen to it, ladies and gentlemen. And then they kind of split up. I don't think Kurt Smith and Roland Arazable, sorry for the butchering of the name, are that keen on each other. They did the documentary together, but you can tell there's a little bit of frostiness between them. I don't think it's a Roger Waters and David Gilmore kind of standoff where they'd really hate each other. But, um, yeah, not too keen on each other. It's always interesting when that dynamic happens in music. But, ladies and gentlemen, Tears for Fears, absolutely fantastic. And Erasable, whatever the hell he's called, actually did a few albums under the Tears for Fears name, but without Kurt Smith, and they're pretty good. One called Elemental, well worth checking out, quite underrated. But, ladies and gentlemen, it won't be six months at least until my next final pickups video where i'll show it off at least another five and until then i'll see you bye bye